This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Red Hill. We're going to be getting a bit of, as much of an update as we can get, but uh, sort of a, an understanding of what's been going on, where we are, and maybe some ideas for what we want to do or where we're headed and what's coming next. Um, to give some context, Red Hill is a series of tanks, we'll find out exactly how many tanks, um, of fuel that have been installed, that were installed secretly originally, that were installed so that we had fuel for the military. It's a military installation of fuel tanks, uh, 27 million, I don't know, some large quantity of fuel, we'll learn more about that as well, um, to store it for pending war so that no matter what the situation and the circumstances were with regards to war, the military always had access in Hawaii to fuel for ships and planes and so forth. So that was the intent of Red Hill. It was kept secret for a long time. It has been discovered, and we'll find out more about that, or as much as we can, and uh, find out really the circumstances of that discovery and some of the things such as the leak uh, that happened and whether there was more than one. So to have this conversation is, is someone who actually knows a lot more about this than me. I know that much. Um, I have, uh, I, I'm really excited and uh, welcome to the show, Jody Malinowski uh, from the Sierra Club. Hi. So thank you. Thank you for show. having us. Yeah. So you've been on the show before, or not on this show, you've been on Think Tech before, so mm -hmm. you're familiar with what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the audience that pays attention to this show, um, first of all, tell us a bit about you and what you do and how you got where you are. Sure. Um, well, I was born on Kauai, raised on Oahu. I went to the University of Hawaii and I got my degree in environmental studies, so I've always been kind of an environmentalist. Uh, I started working for the Sierra Club as their Oahu group coordinator, which is the first ever staff person that they've had uh, about a year ago to focus specifically on environmental issues, some social justice and economic justice issues here on Oahu. So my job is to do a lot of uh, legislative advocacy at the Honolulu City Council level, also deal with um, fundraising and membership building for the Sierra Club, helping lead the different programs and conservation and outings and making it all run smoothly, hopefully. Wow. So wow. Red Hill is one of the, uh, it's, it's a Hawaii chapter issue. So um, it's something that our chapter at the chapter level has recognized as being its priority. But because it is on Oahu, I also focus on uh, Red Hill and kind of facilitating the advocacy and outreach, and making sure people know about it. Um, sure. Would yeah. you say at the moment you're the lead for Red Hill as far as the outreach and communication? Um, we're in the transition of hiring a new person to focus on Hawaii chapter issues. So I do do some of it, but I think our director, Marty Townsend, does a great deal more of explaining the issue, really getting in the weeds. And she yes. knows all the nuances of Red Hill. So she is fabulous. Yes. Well, I thank you for being on the show. I've invited her. I know she's very busy trying yeah. to get her on the show as well. Sometime in the future would be great. Um, but anyway, OK. Um, tell us now, OK, that's Sierra Club. Tell us, if you would, about the Hawaii chapter of Sierra Club. Sure. Um, the Sierra Club is unique as an environmental nonprofit organization that we focus on pretty much all environmental issues. So water security is a big one. We're focusing on water here as well as some of the issues um, in East Maui about the diversions of water yes. um, from the sugar plantations. So um, water is an issue, ensuring local food security and agriculture, preserving our agriculture lands, our conservation lands from development. Um, a lot of the lobbying I do is on development, especially on Oahu, as yeah. you can, they're trying to develop a lot. They develop a lot. Um, and there's, there's a balance that we need to strike. Yes, absolutely. And we focus on everything from complete streets, smart growth, transit-oriented development. Uh, Sierra Club National has a priority with clean energy, so we do a lot of clean energy work. Uh, okay. So really everything under the sun. There's a lot. We and, do. And Hawaii is under the sun, so there we go. Yes. So excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, appreciate that. Get, get some education on Sierra Club and, and some of your initiatives there. So that's wonderful. Um, now, as far as Red Hill. <sighs> um, Red Hill is a big issue, and it's, it's a big issue for a lot of people. A lot of people like to like downplay it. Yes. Um, can you give us... A, a little brief history sure. on Red Hill, where we are at the moment, and what has happened in the near past. 
Okay, so Red Hill is a bulk fuel storage facility that was uh, built by the Navy. It's still operated by the Navy. It's located in Red Hill in Moanalua, and Red Hill is a facility with 20 very, very large tanks. Um, they are 100 feet wide by 200 feet tall, each tank, and there's 20 of them. So each tank can hold like 12.5 million gallons of jet fuel. Wow, and so essentially, 12.5 times 20. Right. Million. Right. So I think that's like over 200 million gallons of yeah. fuel capacity. Um, the fuel is for jets and ships. It's buried in the mountains. It was built in the 1940s, and the tanks are getting pretty old now because they were built in the 1940s. Because they were 1940s. built in the 40s. Yes. With 40s technology. Yeah. And 40s materials. Yes. 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 People died to build Red Hill. It was a big deal. Yeah. It was crazy. Wow. So anyway, these tanks are located in the middle, um, in, buried in the mountain of Red Hill, and unfortunately, the bottom of the tanks are located only 100 feet above a sole source aquifer for Oahu. Yes. So that's the main issue, is these tanks are buried in the mountain, 100 feet over our aquifer that serves residents and visitors from the Moanalua to Hawaii Kai area. So, so that's a large very area. large chunk of Oahu gets water from Red Hill or the um, the Moanalua wells and the Halava shaft specifically. Yeah, the two okay. nearest wells to the Red Hill. And um, like I mentioned, these tanks are very old. There have been over thirty documented leaks. Thirty. There have been thirty documented leaks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wasn't aware of that number. Yeah. Since nineteen um, forties or yes. But of course, um, because it was 40s technology and it was kept a secret, the facility wasn't disclosed until like the 80s. Uh, there's kind of primitive um, methodology of tracking how many leaks there are. It's like basically you look at old Navy notebooks. It says like wow. one drop per hour for five days. You know, so it's hard to calculate how much exactly has leaked. Okay. Um, the most recent large leak was in 2014. In January 2014, the Navy reported a 27,000 gallon leak that's from Red Hill. Yep. That's the Yes, that's the one that um, most people are familiar about. They were, so, okay, so January 2014, they reported a 27,000 gallon leak. Mm -hmm. How did they learn about this? How did they discover this? So, uh, tank number five, which is the tank that, that leaked, was undergoing a uh, maintenance called a tank tightening test. As they were refilling the tank with fuel, um, the Navy's contractors noticed that there were alarms going off, like there's something happening, but they didn't necessarily believe something was happening because they were just undergoing the tank tightening test, so they were like, oh, nothing can be happening, we're just undergoing this maintenance, you know, like, must be a false alarm. So a couple days go by and then they realize, oops there's been a leak. So that at that point, they reported it to um, the State Department. And okay, so, so 27,000 yeah. gallons over what period of time? I believe uh, the alarms were going off for three days. So 27,000 gallons leaked within three days. That's my understanding. Um, how, were they able to stop the leak at some point? I think what they did was uh, they stopped filling up the tank and then they, you know. They emptied that? Yeah, they, okay. yeah, yeah. So they realized it was leaking and then like, was just like, okay. So there was a, so there was a level yeah. in the tank where it started to leak. Is that, so, or was it down at the bottom or was it? I'm not sure okay. there, what happened exactly. I was not there. Yeah. But yeah, what would be great, and I know there's some technology that can do some of this, is um, uh, to get an unmanned vehicle, the little monitoring unmanned vehicle mm -hmm. device that can get in there and swoop around and, and do that sort of an inspection. Um, that technology exists. I don't know that it's being employed, but that would be a great way of maintain, maintaining that. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of maintenance of the tanks, what do you know as far as the regularity of the maintenance? You said that they discovered this because they were doing a tank tightening yeah. and alarms were going off. Okay, um, how often are these tanks maintained? Uh, I don't know the exact number. I know that they do, uh, since the leak happened, they do like quarterly groundwater monitoring reports. Okay. Um, I know the tanks, uh, the, because there's 20 of them, they're in various stages of upgrades, each one of being uh, inspected and given the upgrades that are necessary. But as far as the timeliness of how frequently they do certain tests, um, I'm not too sure of that. I know yeah. they have monitoring on it so that if things like a leak happens, they can, they do get the bells and the whistles going off. So they know that something's happening, but it, 
Now, yeah. I, I, I heard that there was more to it than just the three days, that, uh, that they were aware that the, the inspections or the testing for this particular tank or some of these tanks had been sort of ignored mm. for a while. Um, do you know more about that? Uh, that's just a story that I heard. I don't know if there's reality to that or it's just one the, as people talk with rumors about what was going on. The three days is one thing, but was there a history of ignoring these bells before? Well, I think it's, it might be safe to say that because the public didn't know about the tanks until the 80s, that there is a lot of unknowns about what has happened at Red Hill. <laughs> I guess that's a fair yeah, statement. Right. Yeah, right. So, um, sure. Could, 40 could years, say, 40 years of nobody knowing or saying anything about anything. Yeah, and then they were disclosed it in the 80s, and of course, we didn't, we still kind of don't know the exact amount or what has happened. Do you know the conditions uh, that forced them or that made the disclosure happen? Are you aware of that? Um, it's going back a long time. Yeah, I, back when I, I was I'm young. not too <laughs> sure. Um, I want to say that it must have been a process where the Department of Health was trying to identify the tanks, um, the field constructed underground storage tanks. Okay. So um, maybe they initiated a process where they were looking for things. I'm not too sure on why exactly okay. the tanks were disclosed. I, I just found that interesting because they, yeah. they held it for 40 years and then they disclosed it. I, mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was a specific event or what caused them to disclose it. That might be something interesting to know. Um, okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the 27,000 gallons again. Let's go back to that. 27,000 gallons in three days. There have been a lot of rumors about and a lot of theories mm -hmm. about the 27,000 gallons. Some people believe that, and, and clearly if it's over three days, it didn't evaporate. One of the stories was that it evaporated. It didn't actually leak into anything, mm -hmm. and that just evaporated. Um, what has been done, or what can be done, to determine whether there was actually a leak and where it might be? Some, some people have suggested that it's actually still contained within the concrete mm -hmm. and never actually got out into the ground area and groundwater. Do we have any way of knowing that? I think it's hard to, without being there and being a hydrologist or a geologist, it's hard for me to say. I've never been to the facility. I have not had the pleasure of my uh, invitation being accepted to go. <laughs> but um, there have been tests of the basalt rock underneath the tanks, mm -hmm. the 20 tanks. So this is outside the concrete, right? right. Um, 19 out of the 20 tanks show petroleum-based staining in the rock underneath the tank. So it is safe to assume that there has been some sort of leak at in some, some point, point from the majority of the tanks. Whether or not it's recent tank. or... Right. Yeah. As far as the 27,000 gallons, we still continue to see uh, the with the groundwater monitoring reports that they do quarterly, that there are still trace amounts of petroleum-based contamination in the monitoring well, there's like a system of, I think, 12 monitoring wells around the facility. And the ones closest to tank number five are the ones that have the contamination. So these are okay. chemicals like uh, TPHD, which is a form of diesel fuel, methanapoline, napoline. So like a petroleum-based contamination, very, very small amounts, but they still are detected in the groundwater. So I think it's safe to assume that there is some fuel that has leaked actually out of the tank because we're pulling it out of the groundwater and seeing that there is a small amount. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that actually is, is spe specifically if you're able to look at the entire perimeter mm -hmm. of the facility and right. say that there is a higher concentration around this tank that leaked. Yes. It clearly it suggests right. anyway that there was a leak and that it had gotten there. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that there are trace amounts within the water at all. Right. Uh, is also oh, that's a cause for concern. But then right. yeah. So okay. Um, Surprise, we're already at the middle of the show. The um, show goes really quickly, so thank you for joining <laughs> us. Um, and when we come back, we're going to talk about your efforts of what you've been doing and what you're planning on doing still. So uh, thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. And once again, thanks to Ms. Jody Malinowski of the Sierra Club talking to us about Red Hill. See you in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. 
nothing is making sense for me and you. We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. So try a little more, hard on every more, let's do what we can. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. Again, I'm your host, Carl Campagna, and we have with us today Ms. Jody Malinowski from the Sierra Club. We are discussing Red Hill, uh, the issues and concerns, a bit of history. And now, for this segment, for this last segment, we're going to talk about what has been going on, what Sierra Club has been doing, their outreach program, uh, and what we can expect going forward. So, with that, once again, welcome to the show, Jody Malinowski. So tell us, um, since 2014, mm -hmm. uh, there's been an awareness campaign. Yes. Um, tell us about that campaign, what you've been doing, and then I know there was a, a specific initiative this summer. Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about the overall campaign and then what you've done this summer. So the overall campaign is to get more people on the ground aware of what's happening. Um, like I mentioned, the water underneath the tanks serves residents from Wanalo to Hoikai. So a large portion of Oahu is directly Knowing affected. Knowing who is, it, who is right. impacted by right. this. Right, and yeah. I think um, I didn't know before I even joined the Sierra Club that this was actually happening. And so um, getting that public awareness, of course, is key. Last session, well, there, we've been working on uh, legislative bills for the past couple of years. Um, one resulted in a task force to study Red Hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year, or last session, uh, we had a bill called SB 1259, which was to implement upgrades for underground storage tanks, uh, specifically, well, not specifically, but Red Hill was included in that. Uh, that bill didn't pass, so we might pursue additional uh, legislative measures going forward. I'm assuming there was an appropriation for that? Uh, it wasn't an appropriation, it was to get uh, rules changed. So the oh. Department of Health to implement rules on, on underground storage tanks, okay. rules that would include things like secondary containment, which is basically having the tank in a tank so that if something leaks, there's at least some extra measure right. of catching it. So th yeah. things like that. Um, we're still working with the Department of Health to get them to upgrade their rules on sealed constructed underground storage tanks. Are they being collaborative? They are planning to make rules uh, within the next year or two. So okay. we want working, to... Are they working with Sierra Club? Are they working with you on some of that? We're having frequent conversations about what we would like the rules to include. Okay. Um, so I would say to some extent, yes. But, uh, you we're know, it is a state... Out, so. It's the State Department, yeah. and they're dealing also with the Navy. So it is a little bit... Um, I think that they are maybe conflicted a little bit because they have an obligation to protect the water, but yet they have... I think the Navy, I mean, it's the Navy, right? Yeah. So it's military. Yeah. They're, they're very powerful here. They're very so. powerful. But, but what I'm aware of as far as DOD in general is, is concerned is they don't look to damage where they are. They actually look to take care of. It's part of their installation initiatives is to look after and take care of the community as much as possible mm -hmm. environmentally and otherwise uh, that they can. Um, so that I, from my conversations and some background, I, I, I know that they they take an effort right. uh, to, to do that. So uh, I, I'm sure that this isn't something they're enjoying. Right. Uh, no, I don't think they're <laughs> enjoying us. <laughs> how, to, how to handle it from right. there is, and so. And uh, you know, the Defense Logistics Agency, which is the federal entity that owns the fuel in the tank, they are very concerned about, I mean, it's their fuel, so well, it's a liability. Well, there's multiple reasons they're right. concerned. Not, first right. of all, they're liable because, hey, we're damaging potentially the environment, right. but then they bought the fuel that's right. now gone. Exactly. <laughs> so they have to, how do you account for that? So, right. So, yeah. so there has been a couple of like, um, there's people from the Congress, our, our congressional representatives that have included line items for Red Hill in the budget and certain like things, but it hasn't really gone far enough uh, okay. quite yet. Those bills haven't come into fruition. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay, let's talk more. So, okay, so first of all, the, the outreach program, the education program is, has been ongoing for a few years now and it's about getting people aware yeah. of what 
of what happened, mm -hmm. what has been happening, right. and where we are with it. Right. And has it been successful? Have you been able to reach certainly the people who have been impacted or might be impacted? I'd say to s as much as we can, yes. Um, this includes, like, we've done some door-to-door -door canvassing where we share informational flyers. Uh, we've made videos. We do a lot of social media posts because that's how people communicate nowadays. Yeah, and guess. then uh, this summer, I actually... Uh, have been attending neighborhood board meetings. Um, so there are several neighborhood boards that would be directly affected if there were to be another catastrophic leak from Red Hill. Yeah, like more immediately versus long term. Right. right. So I've been attending these neighborhood boards that would be directly affected. I've attended 10 so far this summer um, to urge them to pass a resolution to protect Oahu's groundwater and drinking water from Red Hill. Okay, so tell us more about the resolution. Is it what, what, What's in it? So the resolution basically provides a little bit of a background on Red Hill, um, a history of the leaks. It articulates that the current plan for mitigating Red Hill is the administrative order on consent, which is a 22-year long plan. It's which the AOC. The AOC, which the CR Club thinks is too long. It's 22 years. And by the time the plan is finished, the tanks will be almost 100. It's very old. And also the AOC is... Um, deficient in that it can't guarantee that leaks will not occur again and it will not guarantee that once there is another leak which is very reasonable to assume that Given there will age, be right no and the fact that we've had 30 documented leaks over the course of the 80 years it just suggests there will be right it is that we can't clean it up and we've seen from the 2014 leak that they don't necessarily know where the fuel went um, it's very hard to locate so it's problematic right and so and one of the biggest concerns there is the military doesn't want to remove them they, they're strategic, right. they're important, yes. so what are the options? The, I don't know, what are, what are the options? They have clean it up, be prepared for it, take 22 years to do it. Right. What else are the options? What can we reasonably expect to be done? Well, right now their best option or the option that they've been telling us is the solution, is the 20-year plan, the AOC. So upcoming in the AOC in January of 2018, they're going to release the report for the tank upgrade alternative. So they're evaluating six top upgrade alternatives on what they want to do with the tanks, how to retrofit them. You know, as far as, I mean, some of them, some of the options are not adequate in my opinion. They're, they're like, we're just going to like look at the tank, basically not do much. But you know, that's like worst case scenario. We kind of just leave things as, as is. Leave it as is. Right. And, it. And then there goes to be the more stringent regulations of things like secondary containment, double walling, changing the material to different liners. So it's a very technical process that they're undergoing to evaluate the tanks. But uh, unfortunately, we cannot guarantee that a tank is not going to leak. Right. And for that matter, tank five leaked. Okay, great, if we're addressing that one. Right. But we have no idea. Tomorrow, right. tank 10 might leak. Absolutely. And, and then what? And then the... the the time, the timeline of the 20 years, right? That right. We're, we're waiting to see what's going to happen. Exactly. exactly. So, um, you know, my feeling on it is that as long as we have the tanks above our water, it's not a good 100 idea. 100 feet above our right. water. Right. <laughs> not a good idea. The only way to completely eliminate the risk of having the fuel contaminating the water is to move the fuel and not have move it over fuel. our water. Yeah. So, and that's a whole other conversation. Right. They're probably not willing to have at the moment, or not interested in having. So they are looking. They had uh, they had a recent open house presentation in June, and one of the poster boards was alternative sites, right? So we're questioning them, like, how seriously are you considering moving the tanks, relocating the fuel, and of course it's all classified. Okay, so yeah. you don't know. I guess it's their land, but yeah, well, their land. Um, okay, so back to the resolution. So you've been going. You've been to ten neighborhood boards. Mm -hmm. Came to mind. Thank yeah. you. Um, what has been the feedback from the neighborhood boards with regards to your resolution? Very positive. Um, yeah. So far, so we're still waiting. I have to return to a couple of neighborhood boards because for whatever reason I had to return for the next meeting, whether it's like they didn't make quorum or we ran out of time, there needs to be more discussion. Yeah, that goes, especially yeah. in July because July is the first yeah, session. Yeah, it's the of election. The so, yeah. oh well, I have, to, like, I have to return to yours next yes. week, but uh, happy to do that. Um, the reception has been quite positive. The resolution itself isn't isn't um, 
it's not trying to point fingers or, or place blame. It's just saying, you know, we have a direct interest in the health of our water. We drink this water, and we'd like to see more urgent action than a 20-year plan. Yeah. It doesn't specify on what exactly, you know, the neighborhood would like the, the, the Navy and DOH to do, but it says, you know, we're concerned, and you should be Let's concerned, too. Let's put some too. more urgency on right. it. Right, and, you know, it's a resolution. We yeah. resolve to do this. We resolve to do this, and the community has, is agreeing right. exactly. more and more. Do you have, do you, some have signed off? And, yes. and others you're waiting to go back to. Several have signed off okay. already. Yeah. I think that's all positive. I think that certainly lets everyone know. That's what it's. By the way, it's one of the important steps of our system, mm -hmm. understanding how our system works, so that we can engage as yeah. a community, so that we can hopefully have an impact. Right. Um, so therefore, it's not just one voice. Right. And I mean, that's really how grassroots community organizing works. Is you have to start from the bottom up. And um, we're recognizing that Red Hill is going to be a big campaign issue for many years, right? It's been three years since the last leak. We don't anticipate these tanks are going to be gone tomorrow. We recognize that. So it, it's about building the, the momentum and the public pressure that's going to be necessary to help push the, the Navy to make the right decision in regards to our water and the health of our environment. Sure. No, and it's very important. So um, we are at the end of our show. Okay. So um, I will invite you to come back to let me know when you've got an update, when there's something new. Sure. If you would like to make sure some communication is out there, yeah. let me know. And you're welcome back to the show. Um, if there are other initiatives, legislative and otherwise, mm -hmm. that you'd like to come on and talk about and help get those ideas out, let me know as well. Yeah, and, we and go from there. if people are interested in learning more about the campaign, they can go to our website and sign up for email updates specifically on Red website? Hill. It's sierraclubhawaii.org. Okay. And if you look uh, to get updates or get involved, there will be like a checkbox that you can say, stay updated with Red Hill, and we'll push out some emails. We do some community meetings that we do in small groups, as well as any upcoming events related to Red Hill. We'll make sure that the community knows about that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, great work, and thank you so much for caring about our environment and our drinking water. Um, and thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so, and thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. We just learned a bit about Red Hill, uh, the issues, and what we're trying to do going forward. Um, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week when we have the chair of the Democratic Party of Hawaii, Tim Vanderveer, coming on to talk about the summer of resistance. See you then. <laughs>